it's a great pleasure to introduce Cheryl Cashin and Alicia Montgomery in conversation this evening. Um, tonight is extra special for a few reasons, um, one of which is because this is a WAMU of Books event. Um, this is an ongoing partnership between Politics and Prose and WMU that pairs visiting authors with presenters and staff behind the shows you listen to every day. Um, tonight is the third PNP and WMU partnership this year, and uh, we're delighted to have Professor Cashin in conversation with Editorial Director Alicia Montgomery. Um, Alicia oversees the station's newsroom, and uh, before, before coming to WMU, headed up Code Switch, um, NPR's team covering race and identity. Alicia, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Um, you're keen to hear Cheryl speak, so I won't go on too much longer. Um, Professor Cashin is a teacher of constitutional law and race and American law at Georgetown University, and previously authored Place Not Race, a bold reimagining of affirmative action policies that continues to be a top seller of politics and prose. Her new book, Loving, Interracial Intimacy in America and the Threat to White Supremacy, is a timely work that takes a long view back to the struggles of those who came before us and ahead to a more confident interracial future, where white identity is not the fragile yet destructive thing it can so often be today. Many of you will have read Cheryl's prescient and thoughtful analysis of interracial relationships for the New York Times on her June the 3rd, um, in her June the 3rd op-ed entitled How Interracial Love is Saving America. Um, I mentioned earlier that today is a special day, and the other reason for this, as well as it being a fantastic WMU Books event, is because 50 years ago, on this exact, in, on this exact day, the landmark Loving v. Virginia Supreme Court ruling swept away racist legal restrictions on interracial marriage, and I'm looking very much looking forward to learning more about that this evening. We're lucky to have Cheryl and Alicia with us to share their thoughtful and hopeful perspectives tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. So uh, I, I thought it was the perfect vehicle with the anniversary coming of, of Lovely versus Virginia. I thought it was the perfect vehicle for having perhaps a refreshing or maybe even a, you know, a conversation for the first time, understanding where whiteness comes from at all, and also getting a sense for what's happening now and how it may be One of the things that surprised me about the book and, and some of the history that you explored. Oh, sugar blood. Okay. <laughs> Who's the mic? You can't hear me, which is surprising because I have a big voice. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. My, my, the quick summary of what I just said is that uh, I think this history is is little known, mm -hmm. and it's worth. In, in the 50th anniversary, was the perfect vehicle for um, making it known that uh, interracial, the regulation of interracial sex and the banning of it was the main vehicle for constructing whiteness in this country, despite the fact that mixing's been going along 
from the beginning. <laughs> or as you delicately put it in the book, nighttime integration. Nighttime integration. Which is very, very... <laughs> or, you know. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that moment? Because there are a lot of court cases, not obviously not as famous as Loving, but, you know, um, from the early parts of American history that led to this moment where interracial sex and marriage um, were forbidden. And you describe one court case about a woman who was, and forgive me if, if I don't get all the details right, she was trying to buy the freedom of her children, is, is that correct? Are you talking about Harriet Jacobs possibly? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So Harriet Jacobs is a, has a memoir, uh, mm -hmm. The Life of a Slave, I believe is the title. And uh, she originally, as a slave, wanted to marry a black man, was in love with a black man. Her white master forbade it mm -hmm. and was gunning for her. Um, and she took a lover. Um, I'm conscious that I have two 10-year-olds yards from me. But be really <laughs> delicate and talk about nighttime <laughs> integration. We keep it PG-13. Yes. But she, mm -hmm. she, she took a lover. Uh, who was a white uh, person, who, man who became a congressman, um, in part to insulate herself from the predations of her master, and um, it was it was a, a an intimate, loving, voluntary relationship, um, and he bought her children from her master mm -hmm. um, and tried to buy her, and the master refused to sell her. Um, and I feature that story as one of many stories in the book of um, what I call sort of allies. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite this regime that tried to keep whites away from people of color, um, throughout history there were examples of what I call ardent integrators or just allies mm -hmm. who crossed the line um, and either fell in love or, or tried to help. Mm -hmm. uh, people in desperate situations. There was, as there so often is, an economic divide in who was punished and who was excused for participating in interracial sex. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mentioned Thomas Jefferson, but just explain for a moment how it was integral to the economics of slavery that interracial sex be punished in one class, but allowed in another. in another. Right, so whiteness was created by the slave owning class to make this new peculiar American institution efficacious, right? They, they uh, for, it starts in about the 1660s. Prior to that, in colonial Virginia and in the colonies, you had white bonded people working alongside black and indigenous bonded people, and those folks did not have any conception of color, and there was a lot of fraternization, uh, mixing, um, and when they started to transition to black chattel slavery, one of the first things they did was to begin to penalize interracial sex, interracial alliance, interracial marriage. They ban it. Um, to solve a class conflict between wealthy planters, the wealthy planter elite, and this restless indentured class um, that uh, was making econo economic demands and resented that once they were no longer indentured, they couldn't uh, buy land. They mm -hmm. couldn't, there was so much that they couldn't do, and they were treated really harshly. So uh, the capitalist slave owners uh, begin to elevate whiteness, insulate it, and and take away privileges um, that black servants had had. And, and we've been in the, in, so whiteness had a political function to divide potentially dangerous whites from people of color they might ally with. And throughout American history, mm -hmm. we see that political move, even to this day. Um, that's what plutocrats most fear, the, the potential of people, struggling people of color allying in politics to demand more uh, uh, from wealthy people. Did that like, answer your question? It did. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to talk again about President Jefferson, because these were, even um, before there was legal status for African Americans, these relationships um, were complicated. And the relationship between one uh, black woman and her owner um, wasn't replicated in, in every circumstance. So can you talk about sort of the range of, for lack of a better term, choice um, in these relationships? Were these, mistress is a word that gets thrown a lot, around a lot with these relationships between African American women and the men who enslaved them. I don't think that that's really appropriate. No, no, no. <laughs> Can you talk about sort of that the range. Right. So the mm -hmm. dominant form of interracial relations, mm -hmm. interracial sex, in the 18th and 19th century was being between masters and slaves. There are there there is some historical evidence of of, of um, slave owners who fell in love, but I think that. Those kinds of relations should never be romanticized. Um, much of it, we know, was rape. Um, and it's very hard to conceive of the slave, the, the slave, mm -hmm. um, so I was almost said slave mistress, yeah. the slave having agency in refusing mm -hmm. to enter into that. Um, so, and, and it's interesting, the only uh, white person that was not penalized for interracial sex uh, throughout the antebellum era from the, uh, was masters. And they, they changed some of the laws. It used to be that if, you, if you're bastard children, uh, children mm -hmm. born out of wedlock, or, or actually all children uh, under the English system would gain the status of the father. They specifically in these laws changed that so that the children of slaves became the slave. And then, you know, the, you know this was part of um, the economic system. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a way for slave owners to produce more slaves, to preg pregnate their, their slaves. So it's, it's, it's a pretty nasty history. It's also, you know, I just want to say really quickly, part of the hypocrisy of it all shows mm -hmm. the artificiality of it. So you've got Jefferson and other people. I give the example of um, the guy from North Carolina, the senator, Strong oh, Thurman, so, right? Yeah. Art segregation. So you've got this hypocrisy of, of saying, oh, we'll be stained if we mix, you know, mm -hmm. we, should, we shouldn't have that, we should have the laws to stop it. But, you know, this class is engaging in this thing that they claim to abhor. You know, it, one of the things that was interesting in the book was how the role of intermarriage, the issue of intermarriage, the threat of it, was an integral part of the debate before the Civil War. Um, and trying to demonstrate that even if you were against slavery, you, you weren't for um, miscegenation, that's when the, the term was coined, was, was so important. Can you talk a little bit about another president, President Lincoln, and kind of the line that he walked? Right. So dog whistling in, you know, from the colonial period forward mm -hmm. in this country, often it was about interracial sex. And you see this in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln was anti-slavery. Um, but uh, he was pro-colonization. It was a complicated position. He, he was against enslaving people, but he supported, as did you know, almost everybody and a lot of abolitionists, mm -hmm. um, um, sending freed slaves to another country. Mm -hmm. um, but Douglas, in these debates, seriously, you know, he would say, um, you know, if you vote for the radical Republicans, if you vote for this new party, mm -hmm. um, it's what's going to mean is your your daughter's going to end up having sex with a with a black man, right? <laughs> so, okay. it's 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 not a bad right? That's right. exactly. Right. Yeah. You read the Lincoln Douglas debates, and much of the debate was about amalgamation, and mm -hmm. and Lincoln was deft 
you know, I kind of feel his pain. He's got to deal with this. And so mm -hmm. he makes jokes and he says, I, 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 I protest the idea that just because I, I, I don't want a slave, I want her for a wife. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. You know, like, you know, who would want a black woman for a wife? So it's, it's part of the rhetoric <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, of the time. And it continues, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Roosevelt had dinner with... Um, Lord, I'm having to see him. Thank you. When, when, when Roosevelt, had, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, has dinner mm -hmm. with Booker T. Washington in 1901, um, there were hundreds of newspapers and people like you know throwing around the word. How could you do that? Simply because Roosevelt's family was at the dinner table, it was an implication that um, his daughters could end up having sex with a black man. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so because that's, just, yeah, yeah, it just went on and on. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the ironies of, of the history is that the places that had the strongest laws against um, miscegenation were the places that had the largest populations of mixed race people. And I think that Virginia, um, according to your research, Virginia was one of those places that had a huge mixed race population. Right. So Virginia had the largest population period in the mm -hmm. colonies and the largest population of slaves. And, and Jefferson wrote about this in, in the part of Notes in Virginia where mm -hmm. he's just looking at census numbers. He says, you know, we're getting to the point where the ratio of blacks to whites is like 10 to 11. Before you know it, we're going to be overwhelmed. Right? He, he, he uh, worried about this. Well, after the revolution, quite a few uh, new American Republican patriots mm -hmm. freed their slaves, you know, and you had um, a large number of, of freed slaves. Uh, Virginia had a very large population of mixed race people. Um, and yet Virginia was the state that was most relentless in policing the color line from the 1660s forward, you know, for the next 300 years, you know, they kept doubling down on this, the color line and trying to refine the regulations. And, and by 1924, um, when they uh, law, when they passed the Racial Integrity Act, that and this is the law that that um, caused Richard and Mildred Loving so many problems. They they had narrowed whiteness down to the one drop rule. Um, um, Can you explain what that is for people who might not be familiar? Right. With so, under the twenty-four law, mm -hmm. whiteness was you had to be one hundred percent white, completely racially pure. We all know this is a fiction, right? This doesn't exist in science, right? But the only exception, uh, if you were one sixteenth Native American or less, you could still be white. But it, but if you had one drop of anything beyond that, you couldn't be white. And um, and if you were white under the law, you were not allowed to marry a non-white person. Mm -hmm. She's utterly obsessed you know, with this idea of whiteness. But it's also tied to the idea of you know who is deserving of being a citizen and being. Uh, in the polity. So mm -hmm. those laws were bound up with that idea as well. When it comes to, you know, you talk about intimate relationships in the book that are not sex, that are, are not marriage, but one of the things that's interesting is that in the parts of the country where the laws were some of the strictest African Americans and whites and Native Americans lived in closest proximity and had were parts of each other's lives, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the context in which um, Mildred and Richard Loving met and fell in love and got married. Can you bring us up to their story? Right. So Central Point, Virginia, this this um, rural hamlet, a farming community from the colonial period forward had whites, blacks, and indigenous people dealing with each other. And Central Point um, continued in that way, uh, despite um, a violence black Jim Crow regime. And you know, Richard lived in the part of Central Point where a lot of these mixed race um, 
indigenous and, and, and black people lived. Um, and he would come to Mildred's house to listen to her brothers play bluegrass music. Hmm. And uh, he was buddies with his, her brothers, and, and this is how he met her. And eventually they fell in love, and um, he drag raced cars and just with uh, two, I mean, I would call them black, but African American, but they were mixed, mixed men of mm -hmm. color. They were like his best friends. Um, and this was a central point, it was like this, but there are a number of communities like this. Um, and, you know, it just shows the artificiality of it. Uh, uh, some places, there were dexterous people all along who defied this line, mm -hmm. and Richard was one of them. Now, Mildred Loving had a complicated relationship with race, and so did her family. Um, and a lot of African Americans do, uh, and it's not something that's, that's uh, completely disappeared. So she didn't consider herself black. So it depends on when, and I, 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 I've interviewed multiracial people from today, mm -hmm. and um, she's not unusual in this sense of multiracial, biracial people will sometimes, it's sometimes in some context, mm -hmm. you know, I, I identify more with my white side because that's the way people see me and others, I'm another. So there were periods where, where she said, you know, well, she always, she said in her first letter um, to the ACLU lawyer, mm -hmm. lawyer that she was seeking help for, um, I am part Negro and Indian. Mm -hmm. um, on her marriage certificate, she identified herself as Indian. Mm -hmm. As she got older, she really seemed to just uh, to identify most with Rappahannock. Mm -hmm. And I get into the complexities of that. What, what's really kind of tragic about all this is that there was a lot of pressure coming from the state of Virginia mm -hmm. um, for people to uh, disassociate with blackness, you know? And this is the, you got this line that creates white supremacy and creates advantages for people who can claim whiteness um, and, and disadvantages uh, black people who can't avoid being black. And a lot of mixed race people in Central Point would pass. Um, and there was a tradition of that. And, and you know, uh, I, I, I think there's one scholar who, who feels strongly about this, and I cite her in the book, feels that even in her romantic choices, Mildred um, may have felt some pressure to, or, or saw the advantages of being married to Richard. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> there's some evidence to suggest that, you know, her first son, her first boyfriend, born, yeah. her first boyfriend was a black man. Yeah. Um, it's all a mess, you know, and this race is just a mess. <laughs> well, you know, actually that was something that I, I wanted to ask you about because the book is really hopeful about the prospect, the transformative power of relationships and romances and marriages between um, people of different races and specifically between African Americans and whites. But people come to all sorts of romantic relationships with baggage. And these relationships are, are formed in the context of a country that values whiteness. And so the people who are entering into these relationships aren't necessarily coming to the relationships with this, you know, they're not necessarily transformed. I mean, how do you see this being sort of um, a place where society can be transformed if the people who come to these relationships themselves may not be ready or recognizing the prospects for that transformation. So I'm a scientist mm -hmm. by nature. I, I have a degree in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> really? I went to law school. <laughs> but, but I read a lot of social science studies, mm -hmm. and there, there's a huge body of research that verifies what common sense tells us, which is that uh, when a person has intimate relationships with a person of another race, and it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about 
five forms of interracial intimacy. Marriage, dating, adoption, mm -hmm. friendship, authentic friendship, and um, parasocial virtual relationships where mm -hmm. people who fall in love with a fictional character or mm -hmm. a black president. All, all of the <laughs> social science research. Mm -hmm. You can find testimonies of white people saying, I love Obama, you know, but they'll say, they're, they're, they, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, we'll we talk about that later. Yeah. But there, there's decades of research that shows that uh, people who form these intimate ties, um, it, they, and, it's, and I'm not saying that every single interracial relationship does it, mm -hmm. but there's the vast research that shows that many people through these kinds of intimate ties, they um, have reductions in prejudice, they have increases in empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, there's a recent um, study I just read, it just came out in March, which said that a black person with a white a white person with a black friend is more likely to show empathy for black people. Mm -hmm. There's more probability that they will develop anger mm -hmm. about how black people are treated. There's more probability that that anger will lead them to engage in collective action to reduce racial inequality, mm -hmm. right? And, I, I, you know, I'm as depressed as a lot of people in this room about mm -hmm. where we are. I acknowledge that this, we are toxically divided. We still have a lot of dog whistling and race baiting and ugliness. But the one thing that gives me hope about this country is that cultural dexterity and mm -hmm. acquiring of it. And what's cultural dexterity? It's the ability to enter a room mm -hmm. and be outnumbered by other people and experience that in a way where you have some comfort and, and you know, there are degrees of it. You, you, if you choose to do the work, it's never ending, right? You mm -hmm. can, you know, my friend Bill Zavarello, who's in chapter six, I, like, yeah, has I a PhD in blackness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody is Bill Zavarello. Yeah. But that I, 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 what I say is this trend of inquiring empathy mm -hmm. and, and, and accepting difference and not demanding that people who are different assimilate to your norms, that that, that quality is spreading. And I believe we will get to the day when a critical mass, not everybody, not me necessarily even a majority, but a critical mass of whites will acquire dexterity and accept the loss of centrality of whiteness. That's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Accept it. And you combine that with the dying off of older whites who can't accept it mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the exploding change in demographics, just the, the growth of Latino, uh, Asian, multiracial populations. Um, we will get to where you combine the critical mass of cultural extra rights with left of leaning, mm -hmm. left leaning people of color. You got a coalition of the ascendant. And it would be easier and easier to get to 51% to pursue the common good. Um, is <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so is your friend Bill in the audience? Raise your hand, Bill. There he is. Oh, star uh, chapter six. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you talk about um, your friend Bill, mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna get back are you, to. Are you okay with this, Bill? <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> no, <laughs> so. Um, you talk about your friend Bill, right, and how he acquired his his cultural dexterity, right. And um, in light of the age diversity in the room, um, we'll just say that um, Bill came to Washington D.C. back when it was still Chocolate City, um, instead of cappuccino or cafe au lait or whatever we're however we're describing the city now, and. Part of how he gained this cultural dexterity was by dating a lot of black women. Yeah, I don't know whether he would say a lot. <laughs> and, and, and in his defense, he, he, he doesn't date, need he dates the rainbow. Yeah. No, I'm saying in his defense. <laughs> yeah. He's not just 
trying to date only black women. Yeah. He's open to dating black women. Mm-hmm. It's a difference, right? Yeah. He dates, he dates whoever mm-hmm. he relates to, um, regardless of race. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you are a black woman who's been in spaces that are majority white, and that goes for colleges and workplaces and, um, you know, you get familiar, you can be... <laughs> can run into a lot of young white men who think of themselves as culturally dexterous. And their opening line is, you know, I, I date black women. <laughs> they need to and, work on their game. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I see a lot <laughs> of so I see a lot of women of color in the audience, and I don't think I'm alone here. You're skeptical. Um, women of all colors who have encountered that person right. who tries to pick you up with this line. Right. That he's really into Asian, right. American, Latina, he, once he goes black, he'll never go back kind of thing. And how do you tutor people in approaching these sort of trans relationships that you describe as transformative without saying that one thing that a person of color, and especially a woman of color, never wants to hear. Right, well, it, you know, it's not for me to teach people, uh, you know, how to pick up somebody or how to date or whatever. You're a you know, professor. I'm, I'm an old You've married woman, I'm out of this book. game. But by the way, my, <laughs> my, my family is here, um, and I'm very mm-hmm. happy to have them here. But I'll, I'll say this, um, clearly, if a person is, is leading with that line and mm-hmm. all that, they're not dexterous. And I, 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 I assume, I assume they're not getting far with this, right? You yeah. know, and if they are, then the, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a it's whole other issue. set of, yeah, right. another well, book. Um, you know, mo- people who are insincere, mm-hmm. um, that's not the first thing they would do. If they're sincere, you know, they would have friends of a different race or color, and they would mm-hmm. have a sense of, of, of people's culture and a sense of, you know, blackness, and it would happen more naturally. Like mm-hmm. you, you, you get to know someone in some context, and you ask them out. You know, I mean, so that that example is is not what I'm talking about. But what I will say, mm-hmm. it's indicative of something. Um, it, it is indicative of the social taboos to interracial dating have come way down. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, there are people out there like ooh. Yeah. Social taboo's gone, so let me try this. And they, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not condoning that kind of behavior, but it does show that the social taboos have come down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I again, I, I definitely have no um, experience that I want to discuss on this stage and this area, <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of intimate relationships, not just dating relationships or marriages, where you're in a relationship with somebody and you can be in that relationship for years and you discover that it wasn't, that you were bringing something to the relationship, Um, you know, background, um, assumptions. I am, as a, a black woman, somebody who's had that experience with white friends who I thought I was really close to, who would say something incredibly racist, like after years of what, you know, what I considered sort of an intimate friendship, and then expect me to understand or say, you're not really black, I don't see you as black, which is a whole other level of of discomfort. Um, When you are in one of these relationships as a person of color because you're not in you know the racial power position in in a relationship how do you what do you get out of it for one thing and how do you yeah and how do you guard yourself against the person who you know after 10 years of of being your school buddy or or being your your the person who you're friends with at the store or at the office you know, how do you guard yourself against finding someone who's just faking being culturally dexterous? Because that can, I, I mean, your book says that those kinds of encounters do a lot of damage to, to this potential. So 
I would say that the coworker or the you know the school friend who you're in class with those, those mm -hmm. kind you know that that's a, a an acquaintance a friendship maybe but mm -hmm. um, if you're not really spending social time together like if mm -hmm. you're not really like it, if that's a person who's never come into your home or you never come to there, it's mm -hmm. probably not an authentic friendship. Yeah. Right. If there's a power relationship going on, particularly mm -hmm. a racial power, that's not a friendship. Yeah. That, that is not a friendship. You know, and, and I have friends, I'm not going to start calling names, but I have <laughs> friends here mm -hmm. who are not black. I have friends here who are black and two, and I love y'all. <laughs> I'm not going to start calling names, but I, I really appreciate my friends coming out. Mm -hmm. um, but the white people that I really spend time with, mm -hmm. um, they get blackness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I just say it's a difference between an authentic and an inauthentic, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 an authentic friendship, an intimate mm -hmm. authentic friendship is one where You've got a bond of trust, mm -hmm. and you can talk about the hard things, where they will actually listen and hear you, even if they don't agree with you. But they will listen and hear you, mm -hmm. and there's no defensiveness or whatever. But if you if you've got a white friend who's trying to, like, I show some, I mean, you know, I kind of depict this a little bit in the book, who's trying to tell you, oh, your experience, you're, you're being too sensitive, or mm -hmm. you know. You're the um, exception. You're, 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 or you're yeah. the, that yeah. is just not an authentic friendship. And that person is is denying your personhood, denying your experience. And um, that's not a person who's really trying to do the work to understand. Um, I've got a million more questions mm. for you. I'm going to ask one more before I turn it over to the folks out here, which is that this book is full of hope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the, you know, I, I was reading the book and, and in the intro and um, the final chapters, there was all this hope about the capacity of American society to be transformed and transformed by love, essentially. Love between, you know, romantic partners, love between friends. Where are you getting this <laughs> from? I mean, especially I'm a glass three quarters full person. Yeah, so. And and can you tell some of the rest of us, especially those right. of us in journalism, where where we can get some? Okay, so first, there's there's a line in the book where I say optimism mm -hmm. is a choice, and I believe mm -hmm. you have to have a vision mm -hmm. for the society you want to come into being in order for it to come into being, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I say in the final chapter of my book that, you know, that, that I'm speculating about what could happen, but what really, part of what gave me a lot of hope is I, I spent a lot of time reading mm -hmm. about California and its transition. I mean, this actually happened, mm -hmm. right? If, 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 I know a lot of you are old enough to remember California in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Pete Wilson wins by a landslide, doing a lot of the exact same anti-immigrant dog whistling rhetoric, not quite as, as, as crass and awful as, as Trump, but same kind of stuff, right? Um, he wins by a landslide. Um, you know, like Prop 187, ban affirmative action, three strikes and you're out. California invented this stuff, and then Republicans started mm -hmm. following their lead in red states, right? Yeah. Um, and I document over a 20-year period, California goes from being majority white to uh, gridlocked mm -hmm. to the state was ungovernable, completely ungovernable, rolling blackouts, you know, couldn't get anything through the legislature from majority white to gridlocked to majority minority to functional again, hmm. right? And I, I like I really analyzed it and read a lot of political science literature, and there were a confluence of trends mm -hmm. that caused California to flip. Um, one was um, uh, 
Latinos became much more engaged in politics. Like, I'm, I'm, this is not happening on my watch anymore. And I'm, mm. I am going to register to vote, and I'm going to run for office and, and put you out of office, Bob Dorman. Right? So you, there, there was that. Um, uh, there was, but also, in this 20-year period, white support for affirmative action went up 20 points. Hmm. Well, what kind of white person supports affirmative action? Right? And so my speculation is, is that part of what was happening Interracial intimacy was was much higher in that state than the rest of the country. Um, one quarter by the by the late late two thousand tens, one quarter of every marriage in that state was interracial. Hmm. Uh, black white inter, in, residential integration was increasing, um, and my speculation is that there were more whites who. Uh, <clears throat> had a sense of what non-white people face. Um, and then, you know, you also had older whites who couldn't get with the transformation of California. They went to meet their maker. You know, <laughs> <or> then, <laughs> you know I don't mean to be unkind about this, yeah. but, you know, a lot of, I think we're in the last gasp. And the, the concept is a geometric progression. Mm -hmm. and, and those of you who are mathematicians or scientists, if you look at the, the mapping of a geometric mm -hmm. progression or the visual of it, it goes like this. And if you look at what happened with the, the, the change in attitudes of same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. in a five-year period we go from a country where the majority of people um, are against it to a majority of people are for it. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, uh, analysis of that movement is one of the big things that changed was that people knew someone who was gay or lesbian mm -hmm. and em that, that empathized the issue for them. So, you know, I speculate and I, I, I say um, in, a, in a decade or two, um, a coalition of the ascendant could come, come, come into being um, that turns, that, that changes voter suppression laws, that, that um, stops racial gerrymandering. That's what they did in California, that unshackles. There's a majority consensus today among the majority of voters for a lot of common sense things, but you can't get any of that passed in Congress because of racial gerrymandering. Just doing away with that, there's a new Supreme Court uh, opinion that's been happening, just doing away with that. Um, could invite a saner politics. So um, I try to, I dare to imagine what the third reconstruction might look like. And if, you're, if you can't imagine it, you can't be part of the coalition to make it happen. Well, well thank you for answering all of my <laughs> questions. I'm sure that there are so many questions out here from the audience, so. Right, yes, we're gonna um, open it up to questions from the floor. Um, if you've got a question for me, just raise, or not for me, <laughs> for Cheryl, I miss you. Um, please raise your hand and I will come right around to you. All right, we're gonna start coming this way. Sure, um, uh, I just wanted your opinion if it's an appropriate question about your views about how we might get the Census Bureau to change the um, identification of certain, uh, how people identify their ethnicity, if you will, based on some of the things you talked about tonight and culturally accepting or where, how they feel about what they identify with or what race or whatever, if that makes sense at all. So what, what's your position on what the Census Bureau should do? <laughs> well, Quickly. I actually don't like that, that form to fill out. I do because I think those, that information is important, but it's a little limiting, if you will, and I definitely don't like that box called other. Okay. Oh. Well, um, the Census Bureau is considering, as I understand it, I, but this is before the new administration, um, at, at minimum, um, allowing let putting ethnicity right up there with with a racial box. I mean, it's particularly difficult difficult for Hispanics because you have ethnicity is not the same as race. Um, I'm of a view that uh, we should have a census that as accurately reflects who we are, who's out here as accurately as possible. And um, if people, people have, want to express their complicated identities, the census should enable them to. Um. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I actually heard something really hopeful in what you said, which is that you, know, you always think that you need empathy 
to make friendship. But what you're saying is you, you can develop empathy through friendship. So I think yes. that's great. But my question is about kind of the mechanics by which that happens. And something I've been wondering about for a while is, like, I know as a person of color, it is... Speak up. I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I know as a person of color, it can get tiring to be the one to educate people right, right. about this stuff. And yet... And I, see a, I hear a lot more of that frustration being publicly voiced these days. But I don't see another alternative. If, 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 how do we invite the potentially truly curious and maybe ignorant and unconsciously racist even, but unconsciously, <laughs> how do we actually open up a path for them to develop the empathy? Well... I mean, my, my law students roll their eyes when I talk about this in class. I, I don't think it's the person of color's burden to ev educate every person imaginable or whatever, right? I, I, that's not, you know, that's not your burden. Um, but if, if an authentic friendship develops for whatever reason in a context, and I, I think a, a context in which a lot of this can happen is just a coworker, right? A coworker um, who you're friendly with. Now, your friendship may not leave the workplace, um, but if someone comes to you and asks a question that really seems ignorant to you, I mean, I think you should have a little bit of empathy and not uh, like shut them down. Like, how could you ask something like that? Like, well, the the person is trying to learn, right? I mean, I think sometimes. Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, sometimes I feel sorry for white people. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> because, like, there's so, you know, like, part of the reason a lot of white people avoid even talking about race is that they're so afraid that they'll make a mistake or say something wrong. And if people jump down their throat, like, for the slightest, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's one thing to be ignorant, it's another to be overtly racist. But if a person's trying to learn something and ask a question, even if it's feels a little stupid. I think being empathetic in that moment and just giving them the answer, um, that's, what's wrong with that? Um, but, you know, I think friendships develop organically and, and, and you know, and if it's not your thing, it's not your thing. <laughs> so um, my question is, can you hear me now? Okay, my question is, um, Given trends of people migrating to urban areas and the comments about how DC was chocolate city and mm -hmm. now it's being heavily gentrified and that's happening all over the United States, can you just comment on those gentrification trends in light of increasing interracial, interracial intimacy? Like how do those things jive together? So um, thank you for that question because another context in which people are getting, have the potential to get more practice at pluralism is in, you know, dense urbanized areas. Increasingly, it is impossible to live in a dense metropolitan area without experiencing diversity. I mean, you may not be in an of intimacy, but it's on the street, right? You know, a city person has to acquire some more comfort with, with just, you know, being around people who are different. Um, and my, my hope is that, and, and I have one caveat to my optimism, uh, and I say this plainly in the last mm -hmm. chapter, uh, I, I don't have any illusions about interracial intimacy uh, doing away with the othering of poor black and Latino people as long as we have Hyper segregated neighborhoods. We have concentrated minority power. We shunt, you know, this group off there. You know, um, as long as we have high poverty neighborhoods, um, you know, I, I don't see interracial intimacy solving all of these problems and making race just go away. Um, I, I have no illusions about that. My hope and aspiration is that um, when we you, you, we have a coalition of the ascendant through activism, uh, the spreading dexterity can be harnessed. 
I, you know, I don't say you just have to sit there and wait for things to change. You, you, you need to join this co a coalition for and fight for the policies and the fairness and, you know, the kind of community you want. And so with gentrification, um, you know, there's the Washington Interfaith Network here in D.C. Uh, and, uh, and some other people uh, fought for an inclusionary zoning ordinance. I wish we had gotten it passed 20 years before, and then a lot of the development around here would be more mixed income, but at least we have that ordinance now. Um, so, you know, I, I'm thinking about in my next book, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> writing about the ethical obligations of the city dweller. Hmm. You know, um, but, you know, but but I, I touch on it a little bit. Um, I won't go on. I touch on it a little bit in chapter eight. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, one uh, quick question: the um, your father uh, ran against George Wallace yes. in 1970, Ooh. yes, uh, and came in second in the general election, as I recall. Uh, I, I that was actually uh, I was a young political writer back uh, uh -huh. not too long after yes. that. Um, and uh, that might be a topic for a future book. I would love to. I've written one already. It's called The Agitator's Daughter. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, the, uh, a couple of things that might amplify, and, and, and uh, I was told by um, some of the points that you made, uh, I was told by an old Virginian that the reason for the uh, dividing line in Virginia is to how much uh, of, uh, American Indian or Native American heritage that you could have and still be considered white was drawn where it was to protect the descendants of Pocahontas who right. were like in high society right. uh, in Virginia and wanted to be, obviously wanted to be, continue to be considered white. Uh, the other thing is I, I came across an article in, I believe it was Jet Magazine from back in the, you know, back in the, um, I guess the 60s and uh, Charlene Hunter, uh, Charlene Hunter Galt now, uh, who was, I believe, the first uh, uh, black woman to go to the University of Georgia. Right. Um, that she married a white classmate. Right. And in this article, uh, even her parents were sort of dissing her and criticizing her. Uh, and I, I take it that that was in the context of the argument that was made where the segregationists would say, if you integrate the schools, then we'll have all the interracial marriage. And then the civil rights activists were saying, oh, no, 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 no. People will not uh, end up marrying each other, and therefore it's safe to, uh, to integrate the schools, similar to the situation with Abraham Lincoln uh, that you discussed uh, earlier. Well, it, it is true that uh, people who intend integrated schools are more likely to engage in interracial dating. Uh, I cite that statistic in, in the book. But that's not surprising because you need inter a place to meet people, right? So you're more likely to engage in that if you meet people of a different race. And yes, that's what happened with Charlene Erkelt. So, oh well. <laughs> I do want to follow up to that question mm -hmm. because one of the things that you talk about in the book is that of all the different sort of um, interracial matches, black women are the least likely to be out married. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got all sorts of theories about that, but you're the person with the, the wonderful book. So I, I want to hear what your thoughts are about that. Well, thank you for calling it wonderful. It is. <laughs> thank you. Um, Yes, uh, black women date outside their race at much lower rates than black men. Mm -hmm. um, but that's true of all women. White, white, white women, um, well, I don't know about the Asian women, just, but white women, mm -hmm. um, um, most women date less interracially than their uh, male counterparts in their race. Mm -hmm. um, what's your specific question about that? Well, I, I'm just curious, given that the, the marriage that's the subject of this book and the subject of this big change that happened in our society was between a woman of some African descent and a white man, why you think that the pattern has seemed to be once these marriages were legalized that it was more black men marrying white women? Right, so I, I think... Um you know, when you, you construct whiteness as the ideal for three centuries, um, you have a certain standard of beauty, but I think the standards of beauty are changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think uh, 
there is a lot more openness uh, among some non-blacks to see black as beautiful. Mm -hmm. We'll also say that African American women have always been sort of the nurturers of the family, right? And you know, I think there's this, this need on the part of a lot of black women to continue a tradition. You know, what a privilege it is to get to form a black family. For years, you know, in slavery you didn't get to, right? And so there's this ideal of, of you know, finding, if you're a black woman, finding a black man. I, I found like the last one standing who would marry me. Who <laughs> 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 would have me. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's still very much the ideal. Um, but the reality, and I t it's painful, it's painful. I write about it. Um, Mass incarceration has disappeared a, a million black men. That plus just shooting black men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could go to a lot of campuses, HBCUs, and it looks like a sorority, yeah. you know? Um, there are not enough black men out there for every black woman, women, woman, mm -hmm. women, for the black women who want them. <laughs> for the black women who want them. Mm -hmm. And then here's the real reality. You know, don't shoot the messenger. I just document what's what's happening, uh, right? Um, now that the social barriers to interracial dating are gone down, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of women who are open to dating black men. And there, you know, I've had law students tell me that you know these black men are full of themselves. Like everybody wants me now, right? <laughs> everybody wants me now. I'm the man, right? And and. Uh, I say in the book that African American women should be open to dating the rainbow if for no other reason to help some of these black princes get over themselves. <laughs> so, you know, fill your dance card, you won't be desperate, and you know, somebody will cherish you. There you go. Hello, my. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Jose, I'm from Venezuela, so I think I'm watching the topic from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, do you think we need to move from the concept of interracial marriage from marriage? And if so, wh when is going to be that? I, I couldn't hear your question, I'm sorry. So I my question is, do you think we need to move from the concept of interracial marriage to just marriage? If so, wh when is going to be that? Oh, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll say this, a lot of people aren't marrying anymore. And, and I say this, um, you know, more people are becoming like Europe uh, where they just have long-term cohabitation and just skipping the marriage part. Um, so marriage, interracial marriage is the, is the least um, important part, in my view, of the of the spreading of dexterity. I think the most impactful is just friendship, oh. you know, genuine friendship. Um, there, you know, there's less, much less boundaries to cross in terms of just um, having a friend, and that's a context in which people can acquire dexterity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I I. I I, I document it just because it's the loving anniversary and it was so forbidden for so long, but um, I don't know when it'll just be marriage. You know, uh, um, forgive me, um, you mentioned in the book something that I found really interesting, which was um, same-sex couples are interracial at much higher rates. Yes. How, what do you think factors into that? Well, if, if you are gay or lesbian, um, you're already sort of experienced being a minority, not being considered the dominant norm, right? And so, um, I, I, this is suspicion on my part, I don't, I don't know for certain, but I, I think um, you might be just more open to, you, you've got that, that, that bond, mm -hmm. Of, 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 of being gay or lesbian and, um, and being other, and so you might be more open to the other. 
there, here's a really fascinating statistic that you know there's some lesbian couples um, have been shown to uh, adopt transracially more at higher frequency and sometimes you know there's this one lesbian in the book she, I have her testimony she says she purposely went out and and tried to adopt um, disadvantaged black foster children because she felt like she had something to give because she you know uh, felt this oppression and 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 really identified with um, oppressed people and and wanted to, to try to give love to a child, you know, who needed it. Hi, um, so this is kind of dealing with intersectionality, kind of going back to what you were saying about um, interracial couples and how, if I wanna be like a feminist ally, if I wanna be, you know, a, an ally to black women and women who identify as different races, how do I, I don't want to say that I feel guilty if I'm with a black man, but there have been times where I feel animosity from other people of color because I'm with a black man and I don't want to be taking one of the good ones. I don't want to be like taking, like that's what, that's what other black women have said to me. And so, and I don't ever want to be like, you know, treading on the wrong toes or offending people by my choices. And so I just want to know how I can be like an ally with gender and with race. Um, but just to kind of like go through those rocky roads and get through those conversations mm -hmm. and also just, you know, try to create a bridge rather than creating like the animosity that can just occur between women. So, uh you, you have to deal with the fact that if, if you're with a black man, there are going to be some people who don't like it, no matter what you do. Yeah. Just no matter what you do, right? And, and uh, especially if he's a good-looking, successful man, right? And I had a young woman at Berkeley while I was, I was visiting out there mm -hmm. say this to me, that I would never date a black man because out of the line, you know, uh, you know allying with my black sisters, yeah. sort of white women, I just wouldn't do it for that reason, right? And, you know, that's, everybody has to deal with their personal choice in that matter, right? And uh, my feeling is, you know, if, if you fall in love with a person and they're of a different color, you know, uh, God bless you. It's hard enough to just find love that works. My, my favorite Langston and Hughes poem. Mm -hmm. Can I say it? Sure. It's very short. It's advice. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm here to tell you, birthing it is, is hard, hard and, and dying, dying is me, so, so get, get yourself, yourself some loving in between. Life is short. Yeah. And if you find <laughs> genuine, authentic love, it's nobody else's business. It's just mm -hmm. nobody else's business. Um, but, uh, and, and you can be a feminist ally in so many other contexts and organizations. You can fight for racial justice, but you, you, you can't change the fact that there's gonna be some people who don't like that. Well, I'm very sorry to be the bad guy, but I'm afraid we've only got time for two more questions. Okay. Um, so can I just see, I just want to make sure I get across kind of to people in the room. Can I just see, who's got a question? Can I just see hands? All right, we've got quite a few. All right, I'm going to go, uh, this gentleman here. Um, we have someone in the middle of the room. And then who else had a question? You. <laughs> this gentleman here has been waiting for ages, but we are going to have a signing afterwards. So you will be, you will get the opportunity to have follow up. So I'm going to go this way. My friend Lionel, Neptune, thank you for coming. <laughs> I don't know if this is even working. You got to put it close put it to your mouth. mouth. Okay. Um, close, close. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, real quickly, you know, I went to school in an era when interracial relationships were quite taboo. Right. And for certain, who you dated was a metric of your sort of black bona fides. Right. And you know, I'm an active alum in my school. I went to, I'm a graduate of Duke University. When I go back and I talk to some oh, uh, <laughs> you got my back, Cheryl. I don't know what's going on back there. All right. Um, when I talk to some of the, uh, the, the the black male students that I mentor, and they I get a sense that some of that dynamic is still playing out. And to the point where it almost seems like an either or. And if they 
date interracially, they almost feel like they've sort of made a commitment. You know, they feel some degree of ostr being ostracized by the more activist black uh, classmates among them. And I really worry about how that's going to play out when they graduate and when they start making the kind of choices that you know, will dictate their relationships long term. I just wondered if any of your books, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, I certainly look forward to sort of examining the degree that's changed and how that's infected informed choices people are making now. That's that movie and TV show, Dear White People. Um, <laughs> I, I think the Black Lives Matter movement in particular, a lot of young people on campuses are, are, are involved in activism. And, you know, and there's some resurgence of, of, of black nationalism kind of, you know, I, I, boy, I believe me, since this book dropped, I've gotten some, some of this, you know, people emailing me like, how could you be promoting this? Right. And, and, and um, it's, but over, it's, it's, it's a very small minority. Um, so, so it's there. Um, but the sense I get is that uh, the vast majority of people um, are kind of live and let live, or they, they, you know, they get over it. Um, and people are doing it whether you like it or not, right? People are doing it whether you're not, not every, every time Pew has a new study, the numbers of people and the percentages of people engaging in interracial um, intimacy is growing and I just don't think that that growth is going to stop it's just going to keep going and it's interesting you look at rates of interracial relationships in in metropolitan areas in Canada and it is really high I think like something like 49 percent of black women in Canada are in interracial relationships and something like 60 percent of black men and, and, and that's a, a country that never had black slavery on its soil so it didn't have the centuries of supremacy ingrained in people, but it does kind of give you a sense of what the future might look like 50 years out when there's you know generations that never grew up with this indoctrination. Um, and you know, I'm, I've said to be, I'm not an advocate, I'm just documenting what I see happening. So I think it's, it's becoming normalized in the sense that acceptance has grown and, and it may be that some of what's going on with the with the the, the, the resistance you talk about on campus is some people on the black side are just resistance to this change you you spoke about the possibility of a third reconstruction i think i know what the second is but could you just define it the second reconstruction is the civil rights movement the first reconstruction is reconstruction post-Civil War. The second is the civil rights movement, and we've had a backlash to it. We've had a number of, of um, well, you know, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. You know, you've got mass incarceration, the so-called so New Jim Crow, you know. We've got stop and frisk, and you've got a lot, you've got unarmed black men getting shot. Uh, you know, and so you, you've got evidence that there's still uh, structures and practices born of racism and racist thinking. And so the third reconstruction, my hope is that the, the coalition begins to dismantle some of the enduring structures. Actually, I thought mm -hmm. what you might mean is that under the New Deal, and this is negative, the second reconstruction that left out blacks to a great deal in housing and other areas. No, I mean, when I say the second reconstruction, I'm talking about the civil rights movement, which restored some, restored, or, or actually for some Af African Americans really experienced citizenship and the right to vote for the very first time. Okay, well, Cheryl and Alicia, thank you so much for a fascinating thank you. conversation. Thank you so much. Uh,